And we are kicking off a new series today called The Comeback. But before we do that, I just want to recognize uh, something that happened yesterday. As you know, just a few weeks ago, we launched Dream Center Delaware. Uh, We are kind of the founding church and financial partner in that initiative with Dream Center Columbus. And uh, man, it is going so well. Yesterday, a group of people from our church, as well as some others from the community, uh, delivered 74 Easter kits to families, ministering to over 255 people uh, who were blessed through your generosity. And I want to encourage you, if you aren't a part of it yet, get involved. Every Tuesday night, we have things going on. Uh, You're going to keep hearing more and more. This isn't just something we do as a church. This is becoming who we are as a church. This is who God has called us to reach and called us to love, our neighbors here in Delaware. And we're excited what he's going to do. And I know you're going to want to be a part of it. So make sure to get in, sign up for a Tuesday uh, this month, and get down and serve with those people. I promise you, you will leave feeling more fulfilled uh, as you leave that place than you did going into it. Well, in 2016, the Cleveland Cavaliers went down three games to one in the NBA finals. And I don't know if you remember that series, the basketball fans in the room, uh, but I can remember thinking, man, if they just, they're down 2-1, if they could just win this game, even the series would be good. And then they went down 3-1. And I can remember texting my, my fellow Cav fans and it's like, it's over, it's done. It's done. There's no way it is done, right? And all the sports commentators, same thing. Sports talk radio, it's, it's done. No team has ever come back down three games to one in NBA Finals history. It's, it hasn't happened. But then something happened, right? LeBron James, Kyrie Irving lead the Cleveland Cavaliers in one of the greatest comebacks of all time. Now, if we could only get LeBron James to come back, maybe we could do that again. But as crazy as that comeback was, I'll never forget when they won it and still ranks as, again, one of the greatest of all time. It's not the greatest comeback of all time because we're here today to celebrate the greatest comeback story of all time. Written just over 2,000 years ago, Jesus' life begins in a manger as a carpenter. Then he begins his ministry healing delivering, teaching, ushering in this new kingdom of God. And then there's a defining moment and his comeback story happens on Easter. But just prior to this moment of his comeback, there was a monumental setback. His amazing story comes to a seemingly disastrous conclusion when he's arrested, beaten, crucified, and buried. Mark gives his account of the story in his gospel. Chapter 15, he describes it like this. He says, at noon, darkness came over the whole land until about three in the afternoon. And then three in the afternoon, Jesus cried out in a loud voice. Eloi, Eloi, lema, sabachthani, which means my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? In John's account, he says, as Jesus hung there on the cross, it says that he later, he knew that that he had finished what he'd come to do so the scripture would be fulfilled. And Jesus says, I'm thirsty. And a jar of wine vinegar was there. So they soaked it in a sponge and they lifted it up to him on a stalk. And he, he touched his lips. And when he received the drink, Jesus said, it is finished. And with that, he bowed his head and gave up his spirit. And he was dead. And it is finished to us is a little bit different. Good Friday to us was not Good Friday to the first century followers of Jesus. It was not Good Friday to the disciples. And when Jesus had said it was finished, they weren't thinking mission completed. They were thinking mission failed. He died. He didn't do what he was supposed to do. This was a not so good Friday for these people. It was a very different story than we have today with the advantage of looking back with something to anchor our hope to on Resurrection Sunday. But when Jesus died, don't get it wrong, his disciples quit. It was done. I mean, it was over. They went back to fishing and when Jesus died, their hope died with him. Their hope of this new kingdom that Jesus had taught about was gone. And when Jesus died, those closest to him believed that he was dead. The closest followers of Jesus lost faith in the end because they thought it was the end, the end. 
game over, no time left on the clock, down three to one, but King isn't just on the bench, the King is buried. It's done, it's over. And when Jesus died, nobody believed he was the son of God. Nobody believed he was the savior of the world. There were no Christians because there was no Christ. So a couple men take his body, they put it, they put it in a tomb, they roll a stone in front of it. No one was planning to keep the dream alive or the movement moving because the central figure of the dream and of the movement was dead. And the disciples expected Jesus to do what dead people normally do, stay dead. And these men who write the gospel account of Jesus' life, none of them write themselves into his comeback story as the hero. None of them were diehard believers. None of them waited at the tomb for Jesus to do what he told them he was going to do. They all gave up and quit. And when they wrote themselves into the gospel story, they wrote themselves into their own story as a failure. Who does that? Not as heroes. And they tell everyone, we all stopped believing. He was dead, there was no savior, there were no believers, and there certainly was no hope. And the people who knew Jesus best, who watched him teach, who watched him perform miracles and eventually bring us his comeback story, did not believe what we believe about him today because he was dead. Game over. They would say things like this, well, we thought he was the son of God. We believed he was the Messiah, but obviously we were wrong. We thought one thing, we believed one thing, but we were wrong because he's dead. This wasn't the way we thought it would end. This wasn't the way we thought it would go. So we're gonna go back to what we did before we met him. The Saturday between Friday and Sunday is often referred to as silent Saturday. Can you imagine what it was like for the disciples who are coming down from the adrenaline high, the shock of what they witnessed Jesus go through, and they wake up Saturday morning just, just wishing that it was a bad dream, but then reality sinks in again that he is gone, he's dead. And maybe you believed something for your life. Maybe you believe something for your family. Maybe you thought your life would go a different way. This isn't how you thought your life would be. This isn't the way you thought your life would go. You thought you'd be married by now. You thought you'd have a family by now. You thought the career would be one way. You thought God had a calling on your life. You thought that your health was gonna last. You thought that that loved one was going to pull through, but they're gone. And maybe you've given up and maybe you've thrown in the towel. Maybe you quit on your faith and your dream just like the disciples did. But as you know, Friday and Saturday may have been difficult, but Sunday was coming. And then something happens in the story of Jesus. Something happened. Look at your neighbor and say something happened. Come on, type it in the chat online. Something happened. There was a game changing moment, right? When you see a comeback, when you see a team come back, the, the commentators, the announcers will say, hey, we're, we're kind of shifting, we're, we're seeing the momentum shift. There was a play, there was a score, there was a basket, there was a hit, there was something that ignited the comeback. And this was it. This was the game changing moment. This was the defining moment in Jesus' story. It was the defining moment in our Christian faith and it's why we gather today. You see, the setback of the crucifixion was a set up for a comeback through the resurrection. For the joy that set before him, Jesus endured the cross and now he is seated at the right hand of the Father, interceding for you today. You see, he is alive. He came back from the dead. And I believe that the enemy of the church of Jesus Christ would want us to think that his church is on the ropes 
that he's got us backpedaling in this moment, that COVID has scattered the flocks, that the church will never be what it was before. But because of the resurrection, oh, is he ever wrong. This pandemic may be a setback, but it is a setback for a set up. I believe the church of Jesus Christ today all around the world is experiencing a new beginning, a fresh start, a second chance to usher in the kingdom of God. And this comeback that we have faced, man, it's just a come back for Jesus to do what he always does with people who are devoted to him, who are committed to him. The church of Jesus Christ will make a comeback. And Jesus said, the gates of hell will not prevail against my church. Are you ready for a comeback? Look at your neighbor and say, it's time for a comeback. Type that in the chat too. Come on, get excited about what God wants to do because he didn't just do it for himself, he did it for you. In your setback that you're in right now, the not so good Friday moment, the silent Saturday that you find yourself in, it could be a setback, but it is a set up for a comeback with Jesus Christ because he's alive, hope's alive. And I'm telling you, no matter how you walked in here, no matter what may be going on in your situation, no matter what you're facing, I believe our coach, Jesus Christ, just called a timeout in the game of your life. He's called you over to the sideline and he's looking at you today. He's looking at you online. He's saying, pick your head up. There's still time on the clock. This game isn't over. Your story's not over. You're not gonna get stuck on Friday. You're not gonna keep living in Saturday. Sunday is coming for you. The resurrection of Jesus Christ can be experienced in your life. And just as hope died with Jesus, hope rose with him. And these same disciples who ran away scared, these same disciples who ran and hid, didn't even show up for Jesus' funeral. They emerge after this game-changing moment, after the resurrection, they emerge with boldness and courage and they begin to preach the good news, the gospel message of Jesus Christ in the same city to the same people that crucified him. And they all preached the same sermon. They had four quick, easy points to remember. They would tell the crowds, you killed him, <laughs> but God raised him and we've seen him. Now say you're sorry. That's what they preached. That's the good news of Jesus Christ. And these same disciples that would deny him become willing to die for him. And this is why the church has survived since the first century. You wanna know why I'm a Christian? You wanna know why I believe you should be a Christian? Do you wanna know why I've gone all in with my life for the kingdom of God? Why Jess and I put all of our chips on the table when we planted this church? Because I believe that Jesus Christ is worth it. Because when Jesus died, nobody believed. Nobody came out as heroes. The saints of our faith all ran and denied their belief in Jesus Christ. But then something happened that changed everything. The game changing moment. And it wasn't just something they heard. It wasn't just something they read. It was something they saw. They saw something. They saw the greatest comeback ever. Do you know what commentators will never be able to say again when an NBA team goes down three to one in the finals? They'll never be able to say it again that, that it probably won't happen because it never has. Because it has happened. Because the Cavs did what no one had done before. And because they did it, now there's hope that it can be done again. Do you know what Christ followers don't get to say when something seems dead in their life? When something didn't go the way that they planned? When they need a miracle to show up? When they need revival to break out in their life? We're not able to say, well, it probably won't happen. Never happened before. Because it has happened. Because it did happen. Because Jesus did what no one had ever done before. He came back from the dead. He conquered death, hell, and the grave, and he's alive today. The disciples saw something. They saw a risen savior. And because they saw it, they believed it. If you've ever wondered what Easter is about, here it is. Christians believe that something happened. That there was a moment in time where everything changed for everyone who's willing to believe that we believe Jesus Christ was crucified for our sins, that he was dead, that he was buried, but God raised him from the dead. And listen to me, skeptics in the room, skeptics watching online, and you go, well, I don't believe in the Bible. And just because the Bible says so doesn't mean I should believe this. Listen to me, the Bible wasn't even put together as a book until 150 to 200 years after 
the resurrection. And thousands of people became followers of Jesus before that time because of eyewitness accounts to what people saw happen. They saw it. They experienced it, not because the Bible says so, but because they saw it. When a, when, a, when a team is losing a game and I turn it off and it's like, oh, it's over, March Madness, you turn it off, they're down, how many points, it's done. And then your friend texts you and go, did you see what just happened? And you go, what, what do you mean? What do you mean happened? They go, they, the other team, they just won. And you go, no way, it didn't happen. I turned it off. I wasn't even paying attention. They won. And then what do you do? You go, oh, we have the luxury of Sports Center. YouTube, so we go and try to find it. But if you can't find it, what is this, the next best thing to see it yourself? An eyewitness account. I watched it, let me tell you what happened. If you stayed up for the UCLA game last night, right? Gonzaga hits a three from half court at the buzzer to win the game in overtime, right? You gotta see it to believe it. But if you can't see it, you can believe it because someone else saw it, right? Eyewitness accounts, this is how we get the gospels. And we believe in the resurrection because Matthew an eyewitness wrote it down. We believe because John, who ends up taking care of Jesus' mother, wrote it down. Their eyewitness account, Mark, who wrote down what Peter told him. Luke, the doctor, who investigated it and interviewed multiple people, wrote about it. And then James, Jesus' little brother, who didn't believe that his older brother was the son of God until after he came back from the dead. And let's not fault him. What would it take for your brother to convince you he was the son of God? But then something happened. James saw his brother crucified and then he saw him come back from the dead. And James becomes a pillar of the New Testament church preaching and teaching the good news about his big brother who came back from the dead. And Peter, who denied Jesus three times while he was on his way to be crucified, would go on to tell this comeback story over and over and over again after the resurrection. For 40 years, he's telling this story and Mark finally gets Peter to sit down and tell him the story. And he said, Peter, you got to tell me again. I want to write it all down from your perspective. And in Mark 15, we get this account of Peter as he dictates to Mark what's happening in this comeback story, in this setback moment. You see, Joseph had been, uh, or Jesus had been crucified and he's still hanging on the cross. And Joseph of Arimathea, a prominent member of the council, who was himself waiting for the kingdom of God, waiting for Messiah, went boldly to Pilate and asked for Jesus' body. Pilate was surprised to hear that he was already dead. So summoning the centurion, he asked him, is Jesus already dead? And when he learned that it was so, he gave the body to Joseph. So Joseph bought some linen cloth. It was all customary burial things. They took down the body, they wrapped it in the linen, they placed it in a tomb cut out of rock. And then he rolled a stone against the entrance of the tomb. And Mary Magdalene and Mary, the mother of Joseph, saw where he was laid. They did what they do with dead people. They buried them. Mark's, Peter's telling Mark the story. He said, but then when Sabbath was over, Mary Magdalene and Mary, the mother of James, they bought spices so they might go and anoint Jesus's body. And very early on the first day of the week, just after sunrise, they were on their way to the tomb and they asked each other, imagine these, these ladies are walking to the tomb and they say, we're going to, to prepare his body to, 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 to put the spices on. And they go, hey, wait a second. We saw the stone that was there. Who's going to move the stone so we can do this? Who's going to move this, this stone? It was very large. And it said, when they looked up, they saw that the stone, which was large, had been rolled away. And they entered into the tomb and they saw a young man dressed in white and a white robe sitting on the right side and they were alarmed. And you would be too if you walked into a tomb and saw a man dressed in white sitting there expecting to see dead Jesus and they see an angel. And he says, you came here looking for Jesus the Nazarene who was crucified, but he is risen. He's not here. Look, this is where they laid him. Can you imagine? Look where they laid him. There's the cloth that they had wrapped him in, but he's not here. And I need you ladies to go and tell the disciples. He said, especially Peter, let Peter know 
that he's going to go ahead of you guys into Galilee and there you will see him just as he told you. And then Jesus appears on a beach and his disciples, remember, they quit. They're fishing again and they come into the shore and they saw him. They talked with him. They touched him. They ate with him. And then they all went on to die for him. Do you think that these men who denied him would get to a place where they would die for him, that they would die for a lie? That they would give their lives for something that they didn't see happen? Something happened. They saw a resurrected savior and it changed everything. And you and I are here today because of what God did through these men. And if you're a follower of Jesus Christ, these men would assure you that your faith in Jesus, that your sacrifice for his kingdom, that your generosity of your time and your talent and treasure that you're investing into this eternal kingdom, that the love that you share with your brothers and sisters in Christ, that your hope in him will never be in vain because he came back from the dead and he is alive today. Peter would tell you, I too lost faith. I too turned my back on Jesus. I abandoned him when he needed me the most. And you wanna know what happened? When I denied him, it didn't disqualify me from the calling he had on my life. When I turned my back on him, it didn't mean that he was gonna quit on me because he went out of his way when he came back to connect with me, to reaffirm and re-encourage the call on my life. And I saw my resurrected savior and he gave me a second chance and he will give you one too if you will put your, fo- your faith and your hope and your trust in him. Because they saw it, you can believe it. And I've believed it. And I've experienced the power of the resurrection in my own life. I've experienced the power of the Holy Spirit that is residing within me, that gives me the boldness to preach his gospel, that gave Jess and I the boldness to move our family here over eight years ago to plant this church when there was nobody who called Adventure Church their home. I believe in it with all that I have because I've experienced the resurrected savior and I've given my life to his kingdom and the calling he's put on me. Am I perfect? I'm far from it. Just ask my wife. But man, I want to go all in for him because he came back from the dead and you can experience that same power. You can live for him because he lives today and you can face your not so good Friday moments of your life. You can face the silent Saturdays of your life with hope, with confidence because of Resurrection Sunday. And you can experience a comeback, not because of you, but because of the one who lives inside of you. And your comeback can begin today if you will do what Mark tells us to do in the first chapter of his gospel. As he says this, the time has come. Come on, somebody, the time for your comeback has come. You need to quit waiting. You need to engage with your faith. You need to get engaged in the kingdom of God. He has something for you. He says the kingdom of God has come near. Jesus has come. He is residing in you. So what do you need to do to experience your comeback? He says, repent and believe the good news. You see, friend, God has done something for you because he is for you. He loves you because he is love. He is for you, not against you. He has forgiveness available for you. He can cleanse you of your wrong. He can bury your past in the grave and you can come out new and resurrected, ready to pursue the plan and purpose that he has for your life. Don't hold back on God. He didn't hold anything back on you. He gave it all when he gave his son for you. Jesus willingly and voluntarily gave his life so that you could find yours. Engage with him. God is for you. This church is for you. 
We are a family here at Adventure Church. If you're new today, if you're watching, if you're new with us for the first time, welcome home. We don't just say that, we mean it. We're a family. You may have came just to Easter service, you found a family. You don't have to leave here alone. You don't have to do life alone. That's why I preach from this stage every week. You gotta get in a group, you gotta get on a team because any great comeback story always involves teammates. It's a team effort. You weren't designed to do life alone. You weren't designed to live in isolation. God has designed you to belong in community. We are in this together and you don't have to go through any moment of your life alone because God is with you and we are with you. We're for you. Your comeback is coming. If you'll believe it and receive it, the band's coming and we're going to close out. There was another disciple who's in this comeback story and his name was Thomas and I just so happened to get Thomas as my middle name when I was born. And he's known as Doubting Thomas because he doubted. And in the story, when Jesus comes back, some of the other disciples see him first and they come to Thomas and they go, hey, Tommy, maybe, I don't know, something like that. Like, I just imagine if I did life with 12 dudes for like, you know, three years that I'd have some kind of nickname or something. So they go, Tommy, he's back. We have seen the Lord. And he goes, nah, I'm not buying it. I don't believe it. I won't believe it until I see it with my own eyes, until I touch the holes in his hands. I will not buy it. I'm not buying it. So he does just that. And then about a week later, the disciples are hanging out in this room and it said that they had locked the door because of fear of the, Jew the Jewish religious leaders. They're after him again. And Jesus just appears in the middle of the room. Can you imagine? He's like, what's up guys? <laughs> oh, you know, like when someone just walks up on you, imagine like someone just appears before you, right? And Jesus just does that. He's just like, here I am. And immediately before he does anything else, he calls Tom. So he says, Thomas, come here, man. And I can imagine, we don't know all the details, but I just know Jesus. And he just probably looked at him. He said, man, I love you. Thanks for being here, Thomas. Thanks for sticking with the team. Hey, I know you needed to see it. I know you needed to touch it to believe it, but go ahead. Here it is. And Jesus didn't, didn't like discipline him or shun him for his doubt. He just said, here, you needed it. Here it is. Touch it. And he sees Jesus and the man he saw crucified appears before him. And his only response was my Lord, my God, you are him. You are the Messiah. You are the savior of the world. And then Thomas would go on to die for his faith in Jesus. Why? Because he saw something, friend. He experienced something. And Jesus tells him, he said, because you have seen me, you have believed. Blessed are those who have not seen, yet they believe. But friend, you can believe it because they saw it. Eyewitness accounts that Jesus came back from the dead and then he ascended into heaven and then he sent his Holy Spirit to this earth to empower you to be who he's called you to be. What do you need to do to experience your comeback? It's really simple. Believe it and receive it. Believe it. It is true. The gospel is real. Believe it. Have faith, trust God. Begin a relationship with him. But if you don't act on this good news, then the death of Jesus Christ and his resurrection is essentially wasted on you personally because it'll make no difference in your life. It's not enough just to recognize it. It's not enough to recognize the gift, to just show up on Easter and just go, oh, it's great, great, great speech, priest. That's what people always say to me. They're like, great speech, priest. You know, like, it's like, yeah, okay, I'll take it. But, but you, you just can't recognize it and go, oh, it's good. You've got to receive it. Any gift, you have to receive it, open it up, apply it, use it in your life for it to make a difference. And some of you, that's where you're at. You just got to receive. You've believed, but you haven't received. Some of you, maybe you haven't even believed. And today you're going, man, maybe there's something to this. And I want to believe. I want to put my faith in Jesus Christ. Romans 10, 9 says, if you will openly declare that Jesus is Lord, believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. Paul goes on in Corinthians and says, you'll be given a new start. You become a new person. That's where we get the term, you're born again, because the old you is dead. It was buried with Jesus Christ. And just as he has been raised to new life, 
you too can have new life. You too can have a life of meaning, a purpose and fulfillment. That void that you fill can be filled with the peace of God if you'll put your hope in Him. So the fundamental question that everybody has to wrestle with and that you have to wrestle with. If you're watching online, you gotta wrestle with it too. You gotta ask yourself the question, who is Jesus to you? Because there was an event, a single event, a game changing moment for the disciples, for those first century followers that were closest to Jesus and pre-resurrection, he was just a man who claimed to be God they thought he was this, they believed he was that, but they were wrong because he was dead. But then after the resurrection, after something happened, after they saw Jesus, what did Thomas say? He said, my Lord, my God. And he put his faith in Jesus and Jesus became God in the flesh. He became a resurrected savior. And his comeback story changed the world. And every teaching of Jesus was validated because of the resurrection. So you can believe that God sees you. You can believe that you're not alone. You can believe that he's near, that he cares, that he hears you. You can believe that your prayers will be answered by God because that's what Jesus taught us. You can address God as father, even that as dad that he wants to relate to you in a real way. You can believe in heaven because a resurrected savior is there. And he says, and I've gone and I've prepared a place for you. And if you will be faithful to me, if you will serve me in my kingdom, oh, you'll get to reap of the rewards for eternity. This life is a vapor, it's a mist. It's here one minute, gone the next. Live for a kingdom that's greater than this world the resurrected savior would tell you whatever you're facing today, you too can experience a comeback because the same power that raised me from the dead, as this song said, flows through your veins too. You see, hope died with Jesus, but then it was raised with him. And hope is alive today. If you'll put your hope in Jesus Christ, listen to me, not a president, not our government, not your savings account, not your retirement, not a doctor, not even a vaccine friend, because anything other than Jesus Christ, if you put your hope in that, it will eventually let you down. It'll eventually lead to disappointment. The hope that Christ offers us is described as an anchor for your soul. It anchors your soul to him because your soul is what lives on forever. Your soul is what is anchored in eternity. And Jesus offers us an eternal promise, an eternal hope. That's why the disciples could easily give up their lives on this side of eternity because their hopes, dreams, and desires weren't for the here and now. It was for a kingdom that they knew with confidence was awaiting them because they saw a resurrected savior and they knew that's where he was. And he said, and I will be waiting for you. Paul said, to live is for Christ and for his kingdom. To die is gain because I'm going to be with my resurrected Savior. And so today, I don't know where you're at. I don't know what you've put your hope in. But I would tell you, don't waste another moment to put your hope in Jesus. He's alive. He's living. He's active. And he wants to be alive in you. If you'll put your faith in trust in him today. I'm going to ask you to bow your heads and close your eyes with me. I'm going to extend this invitation to you as I believe Jesus would. I always like to think, what if Jesus was standing here today? What if he appeared in this room like he did to the disciples and, and he showed up and what would he say to you? What would he say? I know he would say he loves you. He'd say it was you that I thought about when I went to that cross. It wasn't those men who did that. I voluntarily gave my life. I gave it for you because I love you. You're your son, your daughter. I have a plan for you. This world won't fill it. Another vacation won't do it. Another house won't do it. That bonus won't make it happen. There's a place in your life that only Jesus Christ can fill. And if you're searching for it anywhere else, if you put your hope in anything else, you will always be disappointed, friend. Today, you can put your hope in Jesus, the resurrected Savior 
The Bible says because of sin, all of us were separated from God. Nobody was perfect, but Jesus willingly gave his life and the cross of Jesus Christ built a bridge so that you could know your father in heaven, so that you could experience life and life at its fullest, so that you could know that you were created on purpose for a purpose and it's to know God, that you could discover new life in Jesus Christ. And if you would simply take a step across the bridge that Jesus built at Calvary, you can know your father in heaven. You could have the promise of eternal life with him, but the promise of life to the full here and now. Your sin has separated you from God, but Jesus made a way when there was no way. And if you'll put your faith in him, you too can be saved. You too can have the promise of eternity with him forever. If you're watching online and that's where you're at right now, I just want you to tell God, be very honest before him, wherever you're watching from, just say, God, that's me. If you're here in the room, James, the brother of Jesus said something that always sticks with me. He says, our faith has to become active for it to become effective. And for those of you here in the room, I wanna encourage you today. I believe that as you say, that is me, as you respond to Jesus with a yes, I'm gonna invite you to lift your hand in just a moment. But we do that because there is something powerful when our faith aligns with his. When we lift our hand and say, God, that's me, I choose you, I say yes to you, as he invites you to follow him. And so today, if that's you, as a sign of surrender to your Lord, to the resurrected Savior, who's waiting for you to say yes to him right now as an act of obedience and faith to the Lord. I'm just gonna invite you right now to lift your hand. Just say, Kyle, that's me. You pray for me. Yes, yep, I see you, I see you. Amen. You can put it down once you put it up. If you're online, that's you. Just say that's to, to the Lord. So it's me. I wanna put my faith in God. I wanna turn back to him. I don't just wanna believe. I wanna receive it. I want God to be active in my life. I wanna walk with him. Amen. He loves you, friend. He loves you. He loves you so much. Amen. If you believe this, church family, I'm gonna invite everybody to pray this prayer with me and just repeat after me. If you're online, you can say it with us. Just say, dear Jesus, today I invite you in. Come into my life. Forgive me of my sin. I believe that you're the son of God, that you died for me so I can live for you. I surrender all that I am to you and your plan. In Jesus' name, amen, amen. Come on, all of heaven is rejoicing right now. For those who made that decision, 